Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Oscar Talks, Oscar Talk. So it's a play on words because it's Oscar Talks, meaning I talk, and Oscar Talk is my talk. So I don't know if you get it. Like, I talk my talk, you know, like talk to talk, walk the walk. Anyway, so thank you for tuning in. It's another Wednesday evening. It's uh, past 8 p.m., and I am from home. I'm not kidding. This is uh, our office at home. That's how it's. That's how it looks like. Say hello, everyone. That's me right there. And this is our office up in the second floor at home. And gosh, I need to lose weight. Anyway, so um, we are doing. I decided to do this because I wanted to talk to the community. We have already, I believe, two months doing uh, doing this, which has been exciting, um, nerve wracking. Uh, for someone like me that I just, as you know, I, I love the community. I love Phoenix. Uh, I love this place. I love Arizona. And I needed to talk to the community through the pandemic because we're not able to gather as we used to. We're not able to go to the events as we used to. And Zoom calls and phone calls, they don't make it or virtual call, virtual uh, drinks, happy hours. So, and also, I wanted to talk to our leaders within the world of arts. So I have had with me many of our local leaders in the world of arts. And we had Joe Spector from Arizona Opera, who sent me a note earlier today uh, announcing, um, telling me about uh, what he just announced. Uh, Arizona Opera just announced, I believe two days ago, uh, that he's gonna have his own podcast. So yes. Um, Sean Daniels from Arizona Theater Company was with us uh, last week or the week before, and he has his own podcast, um, Friends of Public, uh, Friends of Phoenix Public Art, which I'm part of the board. Uh, Carol Cooper was with us. Uh, Jennifer McCabe from the Scuzzle Museum of Contemporary Art. Tim Rogers from uh, Phoenix Art Museum, and uh, there is a list of people that I'm trying to get to. Because I can, I, I, I'm at capacity and I'm doing this only Wednesday evenings and I work on this during the weekend. How all this came to be? Uh, my friend Carrie Pena told me about this platform that uh, you guys are watching uh, me and this talk show kind of thing through Facebook Live, my YouTube Live, my YouTube, YouTube Live, uh, Periscope, and uh, Twitter. And then I take this uh, information and I bring it to, or this broadcast, and I bring it to my blog. So I'm going to show you uh, how my blog looks like. And the blog is whatwouldoscardo.com. And then you have to ask my husband, Gary, why is it called whatwouldoscardo.com? Oh, we had Nayon Iovino from um, um, Ballet, Arizona. We have, of course, Bob Cooper. Fantastic, Bob Cooper, um, good friend of, my, uh, of of ours, my husband and myself, and an incredible asset to the world of performance arts in Arizona uh, with Valley Youth Theater. We had Tim Rogers, Carol Poor. We talked about Noche en Blanco that happened uh, last Saturday. A lot of glitches there with technology, but you will see what is coming. Um, and then Sean Daniels. I still have to get the entry. Uh, um, from Craig Bromler, uh, Craig Bomler, who was with us last show um, and talked to us about his incredible life. Anyway, as you can see, is whatwouldoscardo.com. I urge you to go to whatwouldoscardo.com and you can click in, in any of these uh, broadcasts and you can find information about uh, the broadcast and also the link to watch this completely and edited as it is, no commercials, nothing. This is just from my heart, and this is not getting paid. I don't have sponsors, nothing. This is to talk to the community. But in and, and keeping and talking to the community, I have had Casa Brazil in the past. They had their virtual feijoada a few months, a few weeks back. And feijoada is the national dish, so they did it virtually, and I help them to have a special so they were able to narrate to the community what is a feijoada, et cetera, et cetera. But with that train of thought, um, there is another opportunity for Casa Brazil to raise funds. Oh, that's me uh, with my um, pop 
print, very Amazonian and very tropical. These are the ladies that are part of the board of Casa Brazil, Michelle Linger, King Isabella Martinet, Michelle Lombardo, and that's Casa Brazil. If you go to casabrazil.org, you will find how this group of ladies, or this group, because it's not only ladies, this large group of Brazilians help kids miles and miles away from uh, Arizona to help these kids and these families to continue on in life with all the problems they have, and more so with COVID. So I got a call and a text by Joe. I know Joe Nunes. She watches the show. So hi, Joe. She is the president of Casa Brazil. And she told me, I have an opportunity with someone who wants to help and donate a percentage of the sales of a specific product to Casa Brazil. And it's a very uh, personal product, like untraditional that you say, like, what is that going to help? Because it's an everyday use kind of product. So imagine if it's an everyday use kind of product, we can raise a lot of money, like a lot of money. So I happen to have with me um, a lady that we all know in the community. She does incredible work with all of us in the community, and she's an incredible asset and has helped many nonprofits. And she's with me. Her name is Linda Samuels, and she's going to walk us through what is she bringing to Casa Brazil and how can we all help. So good evening, Linda. How are you? Good evening, Oscar. I don't know if I can lift up to all of that, but thank you. I will try. <laughs> Oh, you are. I mean, this is so great. Like I said, it's like I always say the people that I, I call and I am um, in front of are very special people in the community because you all take a step forward to help. So in this case, you took that step forward and you are helping Casa Brazil with an exciting opportunity for Casa Brazil. So uh, can I ask you, how is the opportunity and how can we all help Casa Brazil? Okay. The company that I uh, work with is a worldwide company, and we have over four or 500 products that are proprietary to us. But our most widely distributed product is our toothpaste. And I would say that's because whether you're two or 92, everyone in every home brushes their teeth. Yep. Uh, we sell 400 million tubes of toothpaste every month worldwide. Wow. It is... Uh, years of research and revolutionary development uh, covered by three unique patents that utilize natural and gentle mineral derivatives. That's a mouthful. That uh, protect your teeth from plaque buildup. And we do this all with no bleach and no abrasives. Mm -hmm. So because of that, it is so popular. Whether we're smoking, drinking, uh, drinking wine, drinking coffee, whatever we're doing. We have seen 63% increase in brightness and whiteness. Wow. And so that explains why. I, I have a question. I was going to ask a question. I always have a question. Is yeah. that natural teeth? I have some crowns uh, and, of course, some veneers. Crowns, you know. veneers, yes. Everything. Okay. Fantastic. Yes. Very, very good. Uh, and I chose this product. Well, let me just say why Casa Brazil. Yep. I have worked with uh, Janora Hazen, who is also part of the committee, if I'm not mistaken. And mm -hmm. when you work with someone very closely in a small room in an office, you become part of the family. And I have supported Casa Brazil because of Denora, gone to the feijoadas. I hope I said that right. I'm so sorry. And <laughs> and uh, Fago de Chao. So through the years, I know all about it. And I wanted to enter this season of giving as we are approaching Thanksgiving and the holidays of wanting to do something for a fundraiser. And I approached Denora and they were thrilled. We actually did this last month, just before the Feijoada event. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was successful but they wanted to do it again. And so I'm happy to help. So all of my profits from the sale of the toothpaste is given to Casa Brazil. That's an exciting opportunity for Casa Brazil, an exciting opportunity for all of us to look just like this. And tell me about this. 
what people notice first when they meet someone. I am very curious about this one. Okay, it kind of breaks it down. The, the things people notice first when they look at us mm -hmm. is our smile and our teeth. And so as the chart says, 47% of the eye goes to the mouth. So that's why we always encourage people to smile and look people in the eye. And so what better way when you have a toothpaste that brightens your teeth and makes it look brighter and healthier. Then they move to the eyes. And then it's a sense of smell. So like men in their cologne, you know, kind of drives us crazy. And mm -hmm. hopefully the ladies with our perfumes and the clothing and our hair. So the breakdown always does begin with a smile. Well, that's fantastic because we are wearing masks these days. So if I you know. are dating, when you take it off is the big reveal. So I know. That, uh, exactly. So <laughs> it is the double purpose. You better have a good teeth or a good smile, right. or at least they are bright. I have another question. How can we help? Where do, why do we do? So okay. I have to put all the information here on the ticker, but I just want to know how do we do? How can we help? Uh, starting tomorrow morning, uh, Denora and uh, Joa on yep. their Facebook pages will have a little spot for Casa Brazil. Uh, again, explaining a little bit of what we're all about. Mm -hmm. And if you just go to the bottom of the, um, the picture that's there yeah. and say, Linda, I'd like more information. I do all the, I answer all of the questions and all of the inquiries, tell them how to pay for it. And I then fill the order and send it out. And wow. when this event is over, which will end at Sunday night at midnight, I then go over the number of sales with Denora and the committee, and I give them a check. So this is a fantastic opportunity. First, to smile. Second, to donate. And third, the season of giving. So if you are, are just trying to figure out what to send home for Thanksgiving or for the holidays, hey, brand new toothpaste. You're going to look fantastic, smile, you're going to smile, and you're going to help Casa Brazil. So yeah. um, this is a great opportunity for a nonprofit that is local. And like I said, helps tons of people out in Brazil, and they continue their purpose of helping them miles and miles away from here. So yes. to help all these, I will put this incredible email, lindasamuels.nse at gmail.com on, right. on this post. <coughs> sorry. Okay. And hopefully I will put it tomorrow on my Facebook page as well so I can Thank help you. you through all this and help to raise funds for Casa Brazil. Thank you so much. That means so much to them. And on behalf of everyone, I'd like to say thank you. You are such a powerful influence for all of us. I've always admired all the work that you do. And especially this year with all that you've been through. So God bless you for coming back and bringing us all together. Um, and I wish you well. And if if they do contact me through the Gmail address, they'll just get me directly. And okay. I will tell them what how to work that out. And again, I get all the emails. As long as um, you tag me on that Facebook post, then I will know who's uh I don't want to keep anybody waiting and say, Yeah, you know, she's all talk. She never sent me my tooth. No, that's totally fine. We know that you're very busy, but I'm going to put also this note here. Casa Brazil Toothpaste Fundraiser starts tonight and ends midnight on Sunday. So do your shopping, get your toothpaste, help Casa Brazil, and smile, smile, smile. So thank you so much, Linda. This was a thank pleasure. You for having me. Thank, thank you. you. We'll, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. So that was Linda Samuels, and I'm telling you, Gary's cooking something that has some sort of spice downstairs, and I have the window open, and all this smell of <coughs> something spicy, I'm just like, I feel like people in New York, when they live up in the second floor, and the Chinese restaurant is downstairs, or the Mexican restaurant is downstairs, and then the, the clothes smell like the food that they cook downstairs, that's how I feel right now. <coughs> so my apologies. But there's nothing like a good Tito's mm. to pass this cough that I have. Thank God I'm coughing, I'm at home, and I'm okay. Because if you cough in public these days, you will be very, very unpopular. I tell you that right now. So anyway, so that was Linda Samuels. We know that we can help Casa Brazil. Uh, the information is down below, lindasamuels.nse at gmail.com. And I will, you will find on my Facebook page and um, 
all the information. I'm going to share the information that she just sent me, <laughs> God, earlier today. And then, <laughs> oh, I've never felt it. <laughs> Gary, stop cooking. Anyway, so, um, yeah, anyway, so thank you so much. You have the information. Thank you, Casa Brazil. Hello to all the uh, my Brazilian friends. Obrigado for all that you do with our community. So it's 8.15 right now, and we're going to, I'm going to introduce a wonderful friend of mine. I am very blessed that I know these people personally. Um, um, and he is a force in our community, in incredibly uh, charming with an ability to talk to you about the world of arts that you can understand that you under yeah that you can understand and you're able to feel a connection with our native american wo uh, world of arts which is fantastic so um i'm just going to run his introduction because he's waiting in the virtual green room and I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce David Rose from the Heard Museum. Good evening, sir. Hello, Oscar. That was incredible. I feel like I just saw my entire life flash before my eyes. Yeah, this is like this is your live version of uh, Oscar Talks, Oscar Talk, because I am very curious about our leaders. I mean, is this uh, your persona gets all the facets? That's why I presented the diamond at the beginning. Mm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking. So it's all the facets. How are you, sir? I'm just fine. How are you doing? You were coughing earlier, and of course, it made me cough. <laughs> this is really funny because you went to NYU and you lived in the city, so you understand that analogy that I just said. Like you live on the second floor, and down below there is the Chinese place or the Iranian restaurant, and they use all these condiments, and they go upstairs. I have the window open. <laughs> I, I totally got it. my first apartment was on East 35th Street between uh, Fifth Avenue and Madison. And it was a, a garden level apartment, which of course is just fancy for a basement. Um, <laughs> but it, it had a window that opened up into the air shaft. And there was a, a Chinese food restaurant that would blow the hot air. And you know, frankly, sometimes when I was hungry enough, it smelled good. But for sure, it, it would get very pungent sometimes. 
Well, we I don't <coughs> I don't eat. My God, Gary, I don't know what he's doing downstairs and he's not he's not watching. I don't know if he's watching, but I don't eat I cannot eat um spicy. Um I don't know, you know, we live in the southwest. So we all like a lot of people eat really, really spicy. Like Bob Cooper. Yes, Bob Cooper is that's you that I'm talking to. So I can't. I can't. Really? Yeah, I can't. Can you we don't have spice in Colombia. Okay. Well, yeah, I, mean, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in the Midwest and the food was delicious, but pretty plain. I mean, very wholesome, you know, corn on the cob and big beefy tomatoes and loaves of white bread and that sort of thing. Um, so coming to Arizona and having all this delicious, you know, uh, spicy Southwestern food has been amazing for me. So this is like, like I said, I mean, like you just said, I, I came to Arizona. I mean, I came to Arizona as well. And I fell in love with the real authentic Mexican food with the tech, not Tex-Mex, but the Mexican nouveau cuisine that we have here and the street food that we, that we eat here. So I know that you came from Chicago and I read on your bio that you came here um, because your parents came here, right? For a visit. Well, I, I certainly had uh, uh, a background with Arizona. Back in, I think it was 1988 or 89, my parents bought um, a little sort of winter getaway house up at the Boulders. Oh. Um, Carefree, back when Carefree was sort of detached from Phoenix and felt very remote and far away. Yeah, yeah. And so when my parents were um, feeling generous, they would let me use the house. Um, and I would come out here for spring breaks and that sort of thing. So I got to know Arizona. I certainly... Uh, fell in love with it, the, the natural beauty, uh, you know, the indigenous cultures, all of it. So that's the natural beauty that we are enjoying right now. And I think, like I said, I have the window open because the weather changed. And then we're able to be outdoors, which, by the way, is helping us with the current pandemic of COVID. And with that in mind, what are you doing personally and at work? What is the Heritage Museum doing to go and like travel through all this moment? I mean, through all this pandemic? <laughs> Uh, oh, gosh. Well, I guess, you know, personally, um, in between my bouts of mask knee, which is a real thing, by the way, um, uh, you know, I have good days and bad days. Yeah. A lot of people uh, I have uh, sometimes what feels like sort of, um, profound just sort of you know, fatigue, um, uh, but I'm inspired on a regular basis by uh, my friends and family and the people that I work with who are you know, getting up and uh, making contributions and um, uh, trying to make the, the most of a very challenging situation. The Herd was uh, one of the first museums, I think it was the first museum in Phoenix to open. We opened back on uh, June 9th. We had closed in March to play our, our part in, uh, in protecting the public health. Um, we opened with uh, safety protocols in place that met or exceeded uh, CDC guidelines, and it's gone remarkably well. We've seen total compliance with our safety protocols. I guess, you know, from time to time, we've had to remind people to, you know, put their mask over their nose, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, we really sense, you know, amongst our members, amongst the members of the community, that they're just looking for inspiration. And I think they really appreciate that the herd uh, has been open and that it's a place that they can come and reflect and, and find that inspiration. So so we we are looking for a place to go, a place to change um, kind of our perspective to our day to day because we're cooped up at home. I mean, I'm working from home eight to five and sometimes long hours. Um, I'm also helping one of the campaigns. So I'm at about out and about, but with like mask, like washing my hands, cleaning them. It's just, but it is what it is and we're going through this but knowing what we know today and as you know i'm an architect and um, i work within the world of interiors a lot and tenant improvements and interiors and new buildings i have to ask you a question within the world of design i'm writing a paper and i need at least 1500 answers in order to have uh, enough quorum to create a paper with some information that is valid, more so in Arizona. 
everyone that I have talked to is from Arizona. So I'm going to run this quick video and I would love for you to answer which option, A or B, but better yet, why? So check this out. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're both beautiful spaces. Yeah. And they are classic spaces within the world of design. And of course, the Plaza Atene is one of our jewels within the world of hospitality. So, once again, A or B? Well, first, I have to say, I don't know if you're feeling this way, but I have such terrible wanderlust at the moment. I can't wait to get on a plane and start. Yeah you know, traveling the world again. I really, I really miss that. That's probably been the hardest part of this, this pandemic is having to you know, stay so close to home. Um, uh, but for me, it's, uh, it's not a contest. I like A, I like the Plaza Athena. Um, I think in a post COVID world, although frankly, even pre COVID, I was always drawn to sort of more kind of uh, monochromatic warm uh, uh, decors. Um, it, it feels, uh, old world, it feels inviting, charming, it's a place that I want to have a conversation. Um, the, uh, the other interior um, is, is striking, but there's something about it that makes me feel a little, a little anxious, and I've got enough of that in my life at the moment. <laughs> so basically, we're longing for places and spaces that talk to us about safe, warm, um, like where you can spend hours and it's not a moment that you're going to stay and then take off for the next 10 minutes because you have to get going, right? Absolutely. I mean, I can just see myself like, you know, sitting at one of those you know, tables at the Plaza Athene and ordering round after round of tea and, you know, scones or little tea sandwiches and having great conversation and watching the people come and go. And the, the interior and being with those sort of coved chairs um, I think feels very insular. Um, mm -hmm. And I miss being around people. I miss seeing people. Um, and uh, again, something else that I look forward to in a, in a post-COVID world. Are you um, outgoing or very reserved? <laughs> Personality wise. I think, um, uh, I, think I, I think technic, I've been tested for this and I think that I'm an extroverted introvert. So, Fundamentally, I'm an introvert, but I definitely enjoy getting out and being with people and doing things. But it is uh, it's it's exhausting for me. Um, so I've got to you know be careful not to not to overdo it. So this is the moment and the time where you are need to be safe, but still want to talk to people, want to have people around you. Are you going back to the? Are you in the office, by the way? No, I'm I, I'm in my dining room. But daily. I mean, are you going back to the office? Are you working from uh, your office or are you working from home? Oh, you mean generally speaking? Correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been going to the office uh, since uh, on a regular basis since June when we reopened the museum. So I'm, sure. I'm there every day. Um, and uh, we are, uh, the herd is maintaining a staggered work schedule so people can elect to work from home two days a week. Um, and we've got all of the distancing protocols in, in place. And arrows on the floor that uh, indicate the direction that people have to to walk so they don't pass each other. Um, and uh, so far, it's it's worked pretty well. But yes, I, I'm going into the office, and uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a happy place for me. 
So uh, the office is basically your second home. It's just like most of us that we love our work and we love to be in the office or want to go back to the office. But, but you got to, to the Hair Museum just recently. And we know about you because you were here before in Scottsdale, working in Scottsdale. But I wanted to run this quick video because I want to go back to the very beginning and talk to you about your life before we knew you were here at the Hurry Museum. So okay. check this out. And this segment is called The Wonderful Years. Check this out. You're going to go like, what? <laughs> Those pictures? So here we are. Okay. <laughs> Oscar, wow, <laughs> you've really done your homework, my friend. I did, I did, and I do, because what I told you is just like, I want to know about everyone's life, because that builds up who we are, and you were a performer at some point in high school, <laughs> preschool. I went, I, went to, uh, I went to New Twitter High School. Uh -huh. uh, which is in Winnetka, Illinois. I grew up in Kenilworth, which is a, a suburb of Chicago, uh -huh. and Winnetka is right next door. Nutru was a, a huge high school. I think there were uh, just under 5,000 students there. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a wonderful school, and it's produced lots of you know, um, well-known uh, celebrities. And, um, but I, I, I had a great experience. I, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, that's a... That's a production of Oliver from my freshman year. Uh, I'm up on the bridge. Um, I was I was playing the Artful Dodger. Um, oh my God. To my left is Jim True, who's actually gone on to have quite a a, a good television and film film career. Oh my God! So then you uh, uh, kind of like quote unquote toy around with the world of performing arts. Do you still, do you sing? Do you act? It was just a face of your life trying to understand who were you or? Oh gosh, well, you know, uh, I love the performing arts. I love the fine arts. I was, I was lucky to grow up in a city that had great museums, um, the Art Institute and the Field Museum uh, being two of them. Um, oh, yeah. uh, my, you know, my parents uh, really instilled sort of a love of, of art and culture and history in me. My love of American Indian art started very young. It was a result of a trip that my parents made out to, to Arizona. And they uh, they came back to Chicago, uh, it was a very dreary winter, and they brought these little Zuni fetishes and miniature Hopi kachinas and miniature Akamo pot. And I was just fascinated. Um, I must have been eight or nine years old at that point. Um, and I became a collector. I, you know, I would, you know, do odd jobs. I would mow the lawn in the summer and raise money so that I could buy these little things. And uh, but it, for me, it was a window into a whole different world and a way to learn about, uh, you know, the art, the artists, the cultures, and the history. Um, but all of that being said, yeah, I love the performing arts. I still do. Uh, you know, you know, I, you know, living in New York, you get very spoiled. I was in New York for almost twenty five years and uh, going to Broadway and. Uh, at one point, I lived on 67th Street in Central Park West, and I got to go to City Ballet um, uh, on a regular basis, which I loved. Um, so uh, it's all good. Are you still fond of, of these performing arts? Um, do you still go to local perform arts? Well, not right now, but do you still support and go to them? I do. I mean, during the time of, of, of uh, the pandemic, I've been sure to uh, write checks to support performing arts organizations that I care about. Um, they are really, really struggling. Uh, many of them don't have um, the ability to open in the same way that uh, museums can. Uh, I've been uh, watching you know, digital performances, and you know they're not the same, but it it gives me some sense of of, of connection. And yes, I do see performances here um, uh, in Phoenix. In fact, uh, 
in, in preparation for, for tonight, I was watching some of your other uh, podcasts and I saw your interview with Joe Spector and, and the last thing that I saw was Riders of the Purple Sage. Um, so I think about that often because it was the last time that I was in a theater filled with people seeing live performance. So it, it, it now holds a special place in my heart. Same, same with Gary and myself. It was the last performance performance we saw, and then it's going, it's coming. I have to upload Craig Baumler's interview. Sorry, it's been a crazy week. We're leading towards election, so I've been busy. Plus, work is being like piling up, so it's coming. I know Craig. I know Craig is watching, and I know everyone who watched our last broadcast wants want to see it again. By the way, you can find these broadcasts on YouTube, but that's a, I'll talk about it at the end. But I I'm very curious to to if you can walk me to a very specific picture that I found of a young yourself. Um, I always ask this question to my guests. This is a picture that I fell in love with because of the moment that you are in. And thank you for publishing it. I'm sorry that I'm bringing it to this broadcast, but I wanted to find, I wanted to, you to tell us about this person. And if you can talk to this person now, what can you tell this person about the future? Oh, gosh. Um... Uh, I, well, first of all, I can't believe how young I look in that picture. That was taken junior year in, in, in college. Uh, and I think my friend Stacy took that picture um, and maybe maybe posted it on Facebook several years ago. And I, you know, I was surprised when he, when he put it up. You know, I think if I were to give that person advice, um, uh, it would be, uh, well, something that I've done, which is to follow my passion um, and, and trust that that will open doors because that's certainly certainly been the case. Um, you know, we all make mistakes in life, but I've, I've certainly learned that usually the mistakes I've made is when I didn't trust my instincts um, about something. Uh, you know, and I guess I would say to that person to you know, be kinder uh, to yourself. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a perfectionist and uh, I'm, I'm pretty hard on myself at times. And, you know, now that I'm at this age that I am, um, I'm beginning to feel like, you know, uh, I need to start, you know, <laughs> appreciating you know things a little bit more so so is uh your own lesson is to learn and be okay who, with who you are and where you are yeah for sure that's a wonderful lesson because look where you are today and our blessing for sorry to say i have to say it because we had other people working with us in town <laughs> and then you are part of the you are the director of Herb Museum, CEO and director of the Herb Museum. And a thank you to the Dickey family because they have uh, held for, uh, to the Herb Museum to move forward and be an institution that we're all proud of. Tell, tell me and talk to me about the Herb Museum and your arrival to the Herb Museum. Oh, sure. Well, I was, um, I was living in New York and I was working for Sotheby's Auction House. And I, I've been at Sotheby's for, for 19 years as their specialist for, for American Indian art. I got a call from a headhunter um, wow. about the position. Her had been going through a, oops, a, a pretty rough time, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know I wasn't exactly sure that I was interested um, uh, in the opportunity, uh, but uh, but I loved the herd. I'd known it for a long time, so I started the conversation. And the more and more I talked to the headhunter, and the more and more I started talking to trustees and people in the her universe, um, I began to feel like uh, this was a, a challenge uh, and an opportunity that I wanted to, to embrace. So I, uh, I moved to Phoenix at the end of uh, December of 2015. Uh, I started work on January 1st of 2016. And it was, you know, uh, it was a very different experience from, you know, living and working in New York. Um, uh, and, uh, but uh, it ended up being, and I couldn't have known this at the time, it ended up being just exactly the right decision. Um, uh, I've been very, very happy here. So um, uh, walk us a little, a little for, for the audience that have had an, uh, they haven't had the, the pleasure to visit the Herb Museum or know, or know about the Herb Museum. Can you walk us through the 90 years, because I just found out that today, and I'm just like, sorry to say it, I didn't know, 
Um, but I am very pleased and surprised and pleased that we have had this museum for 90 years. What is yeah. the museum about? What is what is the mission of the museum? If that's a good it's, question. It, it's quite amazing. I mean, the herd, we, we celebrated our, our 90th anniversary this past year. Uh, we're uh, one of the oldest museums in Arizona. Uh, our founder, May Bartlett Herb, was an extraordinary woman, a visionary, really. She came here from Chicago. Uh, her, the Bartlett family uh, uh, gave transformative gifts to the Art Institute of Chicago. They built the modern art wing there. Um, and some of their most famous paintings, including uh, Le Grand Jat by Seurat, was given uh, by the Bartlett family. Also, uh, Van Gogh's bedroom. Uh, wow. So I, she and, and her husband, Dwight, moved out to, to Phoenix. He was a, a real estate developer. And uh, May felt that Phoenix, uh, uh, how do I say this? Well, it was lacking uh, when it came to arts and culture. So uh, she wanted to build a museum. Uh, and she did, the Herb Museum. And in the early days, uh, she, I, she there was a, a beautiful house that they had built called Casablanca, which is on the corner of Monte Vista and Central, where that big, tall, pink uh, yes. co-op building is now. Correct. The right. one that looks like a little, like a little open V, if you would. Exactly. Yes. Um, and I love it because it's pink. But uh, uh, anyhow, it's uh, there, her house was there, and it was a spectacular house. Um, it eventually got torn down, and they built that tower. But uh, people would come to the museum, and they would ring a bell, and May Barlow would her walk over from her house, and she would conduct tours of the museum. She was a, a world traveler. Uh, she had a huge, voracious sort of intellect and uh, deep curiosity. Um, and all of the things that she would collect, she would bring back to the herd and... Um, and, and she would share it with, with the public. She would go on to donate the land that ultimately would, uh, would house the Phoenix Art Museum and the Phoenix Public Library and the, uh, and the YMCA, and she was enormously philanthropic. Um, so, we, you know, we're all, we all feel very honored to be associated with, with May Bartlett Heard. The museum has, uh, and this is a testament to her vision, it has really evolved over its, its 90 years. Um, uh, we've always been dedicated to American Indian art and culture, but we are um, increasingly uh, sort of evolving away from anthropology and more towards art. Um, you can see that in the exhibitions that we've done, for example, since I've been here. Uh, Oscar, you know that in one of the first big exhibitions that I brought here with is, uh, was the Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera show. You, I'm sure you remember you served on the committee. Oh, yeah, you know, I remember <laughs> Wasn't that a great party? Oh, the party and the fact that we had such a big collection here and all these artifacts were so expensive. I was just always thinking, how did they transport this from Los Angeles all the way here? And how, oh my God, the insurance and all that. I was just, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I just, so we, so you said anthropology and that's what it connects me with the human uh being and the production of art to express their emotions. So I know that is uh, the museum collects collects art from the Southwest, including the native people, including Hispanics. Or you just show your the Hispanic culture is happens to be part of the Southwest. Can you help me a little bit to describe what's happening there? Oh sure. Well, we have uh, we have more than forty. Uh, 40,000, probably closer to 45,000 um, yep. uh, objects in our collection. And uh, predominantly it is, 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 is works of, uh, of, of art and uh, creative expression um, from the indigenous people of the Southwest. However, um, we also have, uh, you know, uh, pre-Columbian and African art, and we also have a fair amount of Spanish colonial um, you know, that's very much part of the story of the Southwest. Um, uh, so it's, it's eclectic, but, uh, but if you were downstairs in our basement, mostly you would see indigenous Southwest. Okay. 
So, uh, um, and I know you have installations and beautiful pieces by local artists. And one of the ones that I think is so powerful is at this particular one that I'm showing. So I'm going to show you my favorite and then we're going to see your favorite. But okay. this is one of my favorites because I understand the importance of hair for the Native American culture. And this is so poignant. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about this particular installation of art? Sure. Is of the image that's up right now, the boarding school exhibit? Correct, the boarding school yeah. one. Uh, the boarding school exhibit has been, oh my gosh, enormously um, impactful for us. It was originally opened in, in 2000 or 2001. It was only meant to be a, a two-year installation. But the response was so huge. Um, and what we kept hearing over and over again is that nobody really knew the story of the American Indian boarding schools. And it was uh, an attempt by the, the US federal government in the uh, second half of the 19th century to assimilate, acculturate um, indigenous people into mainstream um, uh, you know, American society. Um, it's, a, it's a story that is heartbreaking. Um, uh, particularly uh, in, in the early days when kids were forcibly removed from their families and brought to these boarding schools. Um, the boarding school story evolves over time. Ultimately, um, uh, there are much happier stories, um, uh, particularly as you get into the, the second half of the 20th century, um, where um, American Indian students were taking over uh, the schools, and there was a high degree of, of self-determination and sovereignty, um, and they became places where they celebrated their cultures um, as opposed to you know, trying to uh, eradicate them. Um, it's, uh, two years ago, we got a, a major grant from the NEH, and we also got a, a large grant from a, a, a private funder um, to help us reinstall the exhibition, which had gotten you know, a little a little tired, you know, as I said, it was supposed to be a two year exhibition, it had been up for 18 years. So we reinstalled the exhibition, we incorporated a much higher degree of interactive technology so that people can take a deeper dive um, and find a lot more um, archival information related to boarding schools. Um, but it's, uh, I, I'm glad to hear that, that this exhibition resonates so much with you, Oscar, because it is, it's profoundly important. And people, a lot of people don't realize who live here in Phoenix that the reason Indian School Road is called Indian School Road is because uh, there was an Indian school um, here in Phoenix. Correct. And, and it was a painful process for um, this state to become state and is part of our tradition and our knowledge that should not be repeated right we need to value our minorities and this is a lesson in life and time and it's a lesson that we should learn from the wall of arts so thank you for walking us through that because my heart goes to those indigenous people that are still in the corners of our society and have no voice and those indigenous people that through covid have ha had so much trouble because they are still not in the bus even, not even in the back of the bus. They're outside and they are not being paying attention to. So this museum allow us to see a history and allow us to see our mistakes so we don't make them again. So I want to talk to about your favorite, look at me, I'm like I'm preaching here. So, but <laughs> I want to talk to you about lighter things. So I want to talk to you about your favorite piece of art. And by the way, you have, I didn't know about how contemporary and how modern Native American and Native American art can be. This is, to me, humbly exciting. So this is your favorite piece. Walk us through this piece. I, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Dan, Dané? Yep, that's right. So Dané tell us a little bit about it. Receiving the golden rain. Uh, so this is a, this is a, a new acquisition for us. Uh, it was purchased by Dion and Francis Najafi in honor of John and Ellen Steitler um, for, as part of our 90th anniversary celebration. Um, Kent Monkman is a, uh, a Canadian First Nations artist. He's Cree. Uh, and um, he is probably one of the most uh, renowned living indigenous artists um, 
in the world right now. Um, he had his first show in the United States at the Heard Museum back in the early 2000s. Um, you may know that he just had a show at the Met in December of 2019. He was the first living indigenous male artist to, uh, to have that honor. Um, they uh, commissioned and have since acquired four major paintings that were installed as part of this, um, uh, this exhibition. So we felt it was important that, you know, uh, we have an example of, of, of Kent's work in our collection being the, the world's largest private museum for American Indian art. Um, in this, this picture, this is a, uh, the story of Danae is, is, is based in a, a Greek myth. Um, King uh, Chryseus very much wanted to have a boy, um, but that was not his, his fate. He had a daughter named Danae. And he was told that uh, Danae would have a son, um, but that son would grow up to kill him, to kill Acrisius. So he locked up Danae so, so that she wouldn't get pregnant. Um, but Zeus would have nothing to do with this. So uh, Zeus, um, in the form of a golden shower, um, uh, impregnates Danae. Um, and Acrisius' fate is, is sealed. Um, in this particular image, um, Kent has an alter ego called uh, uh, Mischief Eagle Testicle, and it's a play on the word. <laughs> so, <laughs> mis mischief is a, a play on the word mischief, um, and e an eagle testicle is a play on egotistical. Um, so, this is kind of an alter ego that he has, and he performs um, uh, as. And, and presents as mischief eagle testicle. In fact, on the opening night at the Met in New York last December, uh, he, he showed up at the Met wearing this dress that was in the shape of a teepee. <laughs> and he was walking <laughs> through the, the grand halls of the Met looking really fabulous. Um, so anyhow, this is, um, this is, he's imposed himself into this classic um, Greek myth. Um, uh, Mr. Fetal Tusk is always is, is wearing a pair of you know very fancy high heels, as you could see um, she is in this painting. Um, but it's also a riff on um, on the Hudson School and artists like Albert Bierstadt. There's a, a heavy influence there, and and Kent is trying to make the point that American Indian art is American art. It's frequently treated separately, um, and one of the objectives of the Herb Museum right now is to really underscore the important contributions that uh, indigenous artists are making, not just to American art, but to contemporary art as well, global and contemporary art. So this is quite exciting. I didn't know about this piece. I didn't know the tradition and the narrative behind it. And what I really think is striking is the way that is presented to the audience um, in a very uh, kind of like, lonely way individually so it is powerful i'm going to show this picture where you can see how is presented in the museum so that's the installation at the herd and i'll tell you the, yes. the inspiration for this was a was a dinner that i went to with tom ford that he designed and the room was completely black everything was black the table collage the wall and uh and then there was in the center of each of these tables just a single calla a sort of pin light down on the calendar. It was so <laughs> elegant. So I wanted to create the, the same sort of feeling in, in this exhibition. I wanted a very, very dark room. It's the only painting in the room. So people can walk in, they can very easily socially dis distance, um, but they can just be enveloped by the, um, by the shimmer and the beauty of this, this painting. And there are so many layers as we just discussed. There's a lot to contemplate. So it's a it's kind of a moody space, but I hope people will come and see it. And it's open. You can go to the museum and see it then, right? Absolutely. It's up right now. Uh, and we are open uh, Tuesday through Sunday. So, so, so I, I want to show, correct. I want to show here real quick. Uh, uh, the website is uh, www.herd.org. So go to herd.org. Uh, and you can uh, find out 
uh, specific information, right? Sp find specifics about the museum, how to support it. What is going to happen with the Blue Moon Dance Gala that you guys host every end of uh, winter? Oh, thank you for asking. So, so this Saturday, the museum is open uh, to the public and it is free admission for the entire day. We're doing this to honor our, our health heroes and frontline responders. Um, this would ordinarily be the time of year that we host Moon Dance, which is our biggest annual fundraiser. Correct. Uh, it became very clear back in, in late March, early April, when we would ordinarily be doing a kickoff for Moon Dance, um, that it this was not the year to be to be doing that, especially because COVID had had such a, uh, a disproportionate impact on Indigenous communities. Okay. So we we pivoted to this this campaign called Once in a Blue Moon with the hope that what we're experiencing right now would be as rare as a blue moon. Um, right. And Oscar, it's oh gosh, we didn't know what to expect, and it's been absolutely extraordinary. We we've raised. Uh, a little over eight hundred and seventy-five thousand wow. dollars in this campaign. Um, people have been enormously uh, generous, um, and it's been so inspiring to us um, to, to keep doing the work that we do. Um, and of course, we acknowledge it fully as just a love of the Herb Museum, and uh, people um, desire to make sure that that it weathers the storm. Is is it's part of it's part of where we are what is happening in our community and is part of um, the difficult time that we're going through. So, but I wanna show that specific um, um, page. Uh, so you can tell us a little bit of how can we help or how can the audience help because I'm sure it's still going, right? Once in the blue moon. Yes, oh, well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, first of all, I hope you'll come to the museum on, on Saturday. Um, we're gonna have live music and other things going on. Um, I think it'll be a, a beautiful day. Um, we are in, uh, inaugurating a, uh, a new garden that's called the Once in a Blue Moon Garden. That day, it's right at the entrance of the museum. We want everybody to know that when, when we were in our darkest hour, um, all these extraordinary people uh, provided uh, light. Um, so you'll have a chance to, to see that garden. You can go to the website and you can make a contribution um, of any size, it's all helpful to us. Um, we you know, would also encourage you, if you're not a member, to become a member. It's a great way to uh, to to be engaged with the museum. Um, we'd love to see you in person, but we're also offering you know digital and online content. Um, if you're not yet comfortable to come down and, and join us in person, that's fantastic. And with that train of thought. Um, I know that to a museum, um, in order to move forward or to an institution, either it's a performance arts or applied arts, those that support the museum and the institution are very, very important. And with that train of thought, I thought to myself, I just have to call those people that make a difference. And they're always presto in Italian, like ready to give you a hand. And I happened to have an answer from one of the, how do I say this? Out most wonderful people that I know in this community and is a support to the museum and to all of us is our Christy Vesales. Hello, Christy. Hi, Christy. <laughs> I think we cannot hear you, but we're gonna hear you. So you have to unmute your your headphones. Let me see if you can do this. We, okay. There it is. Is that better? That's better. How are you, Christy? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me, Oscar. Hi, David. Hi, Christy. It's so great to see you guys. So I wanted to have Christy with us because I wanted her to send us and send you a message because it's very important for us to be together and to keep on moving. So go ahead, Christy. Well, you know, I've known David for about 15 years. Even before he came to the herd, I was so excited when when they selected him to be the new directors. Oh, and he has brought with him such tremendous depth of knowledge and also a unique vision for the museum and some tremendous insight. And he's done some really, he's had some really great innovative ideas around events and uh, exhibitions and programming 
it's really revitalized the museum, energized the community, and brought a lot of excitement back to the museum. So I want to thank David for that because I just think it's 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 an all new museum under your leadership, and I appreciate that so much. So thank you so much, Chrissy. This is very special. David, go ahead. Oh, well, I would just say, first of all, Christy is a trustee of the museum and you couldn't ask for a better trustee. You can, you can see she's just a, a bolt of light and energy. Um, and I also want to you know, call out something that, that Christy's been doing that's very, very special. She's been um, bringing PPE supplies to the Navajo Nation. Christy, I hope you'll talk about that. It's such an important effort. Well, one of our other trustees, Ginger Sykes Torres, she's Navajo and is from Tuba City. And uh, she, her mother and her sister began making masks for the people that they knew in Tuba City because they weren't able to get them. And then they were finding, well, actually they ended up making 750 masks, wow. personally, three of them. And then they found that, that there were a lot of uh, uh, sanitation supplies and everything related to preventing COVID from spreading that they just weren't able to obtain up there on the reservation. And so we started, um, she, her husband, and I, and um, Russ Dickey and his wife, Erica, and um, Carletta Chief, who was in Flagstaff, and um, uh, Adrian, uh, Andrea, Andrea um, Odegaard, Tor uh, sorry, Bidet. Yes. Anyway, so we started raising funds on GoFundMe. We initially had a $5,000 goal and we met that rather quickly and turned around and spent it immediately on anything we could get that was sanitation related. Um, and so then we raised another five and another five and just kept going up, increasing our goal. We have a goal of 65,000. I think we've raised about 63,000 so far and have spent every dime of that. As soon as we get it, we buy supplies and send it up. And we, at the height of our uh, activity we were doing like two and three shipments downloads a week and so um subsequently then a lot of mass makers around the country and here in the valley and even a, a, one of ginger's friends from college at stanford whose mother still lives in vietnam her family made a thousand masks and sent them to us to send up to the Navajo Nation. So that's been just really an incredible response. And certainly there's, it's up, COVID is on the uptick again, well, not only across the state, but also on the Navajo Nation and they have had to start doing curfews again. And so, Anybody who wants to donate, we can seriously use the donations. And another thing that has happened, which has been so heartwarming, a group in Connecticut, they started making quilts to give to the families who lost loved ones in the Sandy Hook shooting. And so they have subsequently continued making quilts and giving them to future tragedies in this country. Yeah. And so they've made at least 1,200 quilts, all handmade, pieces cut and sewn and quilted. They're just remarkable works of art in and of themselves, but also just so full of love. And they donated 145 quilts for us to give to members of the Navajo Nation. And we've been giving them to the most elderly 
as well as people who have lost loved ones during the pandemic. So Ginger and her husband Javi and their three kids, they got into their SUV loaded with supplies and some quilts. I got into my SUV with supplies and quilts and we drove them up at the beginning of October and and distributed about um, about 15 of them and left a few uh, with our boots on the ground, Marie, uh, into the city. And she knows. And then I drove down to, um, well, actually, you know, um, I have to give a plug for the hoop dance, which is every February at the herd, which is phenomenal. So Eric, um, Eric Manuelito, who is our hoop dance arena director. He lives in Tohachi. So I drove up there and took some supplies and some quilts for him to give to people who the elderly and those about ones in that in that little town. Then um, last week I drove up to Tuba City and delivered some more quilts. Uh, oh this time I took up Four dozen. And so little by little, we're getting them out there. And um, oh, the cool thing was there was a French, two French video journalists who also met with me and Marie and did videotaping. They are um, doing some coverage of COVID on the reservation. And they, met with them at what we call the pantry. Because as we buy things, we've been storing them there into the city. Because we just had to buy as much of everything we could get at the time it was available, whether it be bleach, hand sanitizer, um, spray sanitizer, uh, nitrile gloves, surgical masks, all those things, and, you know, and of course we couldn't necessarily distribute all of them all of the time, every time we got them, because people had to them at different times. So we just compiling all those things in the LPE pantry, and then when people throughout the reservation, primarily the western part, but we've given out supplies throughout the entire Navajo Nation, as well as the White Mountain Apaches and other um, Native American health uh, community outreach workers who've contacted us because word has traveled on the Moccasin Telegraph. And so, yeah, so there's, we've been able to help a lot. This is this is amazing because I am sure I, I am very proud of our own people and all of you for what you've done. So if you, uh, the audience, you don't know what is a, a hoop dance, this is how it looks like. And it's a tradition uh, in the Native American culture. Thank you so much, Christy, for all of what you do for the community, but mostly during these very difficult times because we know that you had a very personal loss and you're still working, you're still doing it, you're still present. And that is a pride for all of us to have someone like you in our community. So thank you so much for stopping by. We say goodbye to you. Thank you so much. So we, I'm gonna continue talking to David, which is the guest of tonight. So thank you for stopping by. Wonderful to see you both. Wonderful to see you. So this is what it makes uh, uh, an organization is the people that you call in and the people that are part of the organization. And in that, friend, in that type of conversation, I have some comments. So Patsy Lori, okay. <laughs> she just asked a question. So she says, Oscar and David are beautifully connected. They con their conversation is engaging and in interesting. A great show, what a great guest. But she previously, she asked, what is the most important piece of art in the museum? Oh. <laughs> this is Patsy Laurie. <laughs> you better get this one right. <laughs> that, you know, that's a great question. And it's, it's, it's a question that we ask ourselves because um, uh, it's, 
sometimes we play this game amongst ourselves. You know, if there was a fire, what's the one piece we would grab? You know, as we ran out of the museum, my Gucci um, shoes. So I, one thing I, I want to be clear about is that uh, not everything in, in her museum is is a work of art. There are things that were made in context um, that often possess the powers of a great work of art, but they weren't actually made as a work of art. Um, and it's important to understand the, the distinction. Um, uh, so with that being said, uh, there's a, a first phase blanket uh, that is a, it's an early Navajo classic man's wearing blanket, very simple. It's, it's, uh, it's bands of, of hand spun ivory and dark brown wool um, overlaid with very thin stripes of indigo blue dyed wool. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. There's not many of these first phase blankets in existence. Um, it's a very kind of subtle aesthetic, um, but this is a, a very, very special piece. Um, so I guess, I guess that, that might be the piece that I would grab if the, the museum were on fire. Mm -hmm. And that's a good, that's a very good answer because to me, I've seen the blankets and I understand the tradition. And if you go right now to Northern Arizona, you will know that it's knowing and you will know the importance of objects and how our Native Americans were able to make these objects everyday use a piece of art. So this composition that I have here, can you walk us through this one quickly? Oh, sure. Well, this is from uh, our exhibition called Home, which is an installation, uh, more or less of highlights of, from our, our permanent collection. Uh, it showcases all 22 of the indigenous tribes of Arizona. Uh, in this particular case, you're looking at a, a wonderful group of Navajo pictorial textiles um, from different um, time periods. Um, uh, the, the, the Germantown, which is sort of front and center with the, uh, with the trains going across that sort of central band and then these sort of wild zigzags, you know, yeah. above and below. Um, that was, uh, you know, the Germantown weavings are so fantastic because they were made in the late 19th and early 20th century. It followed a very dark time in Navajo history uh, when they were interned at Bosque Redondo. Um, but immediately following that, um, they suddenly had access to aniline colors and these commercial wools. So Germantown refers to a, a, a wool mill in Germantown, Pennsylvania. And you know, these weavers, they, they were artists at heart. And of course they embraced these new colors and these new mediums. They started making these incredible, uh, very colorful textiles. Um, they also started adding the uh, pictorial elements. They started to weave what they were seeing. And of course the railroad um, making its way across their homelands was a, a striking development. Um, so you began to see uh, you know, trains appearing in these in these blankets as well. Um, uh, but you've got in this in this particular image, you literally have uh, about a hundred uh, about oh gosh, one hundred twenty five years of Navajo Navajo weaving represented. Wow, and I know the weaving is a beautiful tradition of the Navajo culture and the Native American culture. So I'm going to run this quick video so we can see what weaving means to the Native Americans. Pay attention, this is just beautiful. Gather around here. We have a tradition in our family that um, each piece that is done is, um, we consider it our baby and that we uh, are, our grandmothers and our moms, our sisters, our aunts, they always pray over their pieces. Remember, like I said, when you set up a warp, it's like giving birth to a child. And as you're weaving, it's like watching your child grow. I know when you finish Oya, and you want them to go to a nice home or you want them to have a nice life.
That was a quick, incredible play. I watched it through. I have to make some cuts because of the broadcasts. But I was like crying at the end because I didn't <laughs> know the traditions. I mean, this is very important and very personal for the Navajo culture. It is, and I, I get very emotional at, at, at that video as well. I've seen it many times at this point, but it never, it never fails to move me. This is part of a, an initiative that's underwritten by the Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, which is a, a Minnesota-based foundation. And it's, it's, it's the Herb Museum Master Artist Workshop Series. And what, what we are facilitating is the transference of cultural knowledge between master artists and, uh, in this instance, uh, Navajo people um, who uh, had an interest in learning how to weave understanding that weaving is uh, as foundational to their culture as, as anything. Um, uh, so it's, uh, as you can tell from the video, some of these people had never woven at all. Some of them had a little more experience, um, but uh, no one left that workshop without feeling profoundly changed by, by, by what they learned and, and the camaraderie that they felt with the people who were participating. So I was able to understand that because I saw that video and there's an other video that you, the museum has that explain a little bit more about um, the traditions behind um, the Native American uh, art that the Herb Museum has and the importance of weaving. So if uh, I just put that on the, uh, on the ticker, if you want more information, you can go to the Herb Museum www.herdmuseum.org to get more information and you can get actually more information i'm sorry this is my side computer uh, of once in a blue moon and the upcoming opening this weekend uh with some performances out in the how what is the name of that courtyard with um, um the courtyard in front of the museum it's called the once in a blue moon garden once um, in the you blue moon garden. just as, as you first as you first come in um yeah and I saw a beautiful picture recently uh, of Cindy McCain, one of my personal superheroes. I just, um, she was hosting some um, candidates uh, at the museum and I just saw her, I haven't seen her wearing traditional garments of the Navajo uh, reservation or the Navajo, made by Navajo. And it was just very touching to see how someone of her stature is connected to our traditions. Beautiful. It was incredible, that sort of yellow dress with the, the Navajo squash blossom necklace with the silver and the turquoise. It, it really was stunning. That was an important moment because uh, you had uh, Vice President Biden and Kamala Harris uh, visiting the first national um, American Indian Veterans Memorial. Um, and at the same time, they, uh, they were using the herd as a backdrop to meet with tribal leadership from around the state. That was really what the visit was about. Um, uh, and it was a it was a special day. Very very special. And and thank you to Christy Vizales because I know she put all her turquoise, and it was just striking to see a woman wearing the traditional jewelry. So thank you. Um, um, our time is up. It's past nine. I, we can be here forever because I, I I'm sorry that I don't know much about um, the Hurry Museum, but I'm learning a lot through you and a lot through what basically I found out through researching for tonight, my research for tonight. Before I let you go, I want to sh uh, share this particular piece and perhaps you can help me uh, to talk about him. Um, let me see, let me see if I can bring this up because technology always helps um, to make the conversation easy. So let me show you this piece. I'm not gonna, if you don't know, we can find information about oh. self-portrait in studio. It's so remarkable, so modern. It, it's fantastic. That, that's by an artist named T.C. Cannon. We did a show a couple of years ago called Of God and Mortal Men. And that's a, a self-portrait of, of the artist in a, in a studio. Um, if you know Santa Fe at all, uh, he was uh, in a studio that is where the San Busco Center is now. And those are the beautiful Sangre Mountains in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in the background. T.C. Cannon was a brilliant, talented artist who tragically died uh, at the age of 31. Um, he was destined to have a, a huge career. Um, uh, he, his work was, was truly, it was transcendent. Um, so 
it's, it's always bittersweet um, when you contemplate his work to think about what, what might have been, but certainly what he left behind uh, is hugely important and, and powerful. And this is, yeah, there's just something about, uh, about this picture, the, the way he's staring at the viewer, and he's so confident in sort of the posture. Um, uh, it's, it's really special. I'm glad you like that, Oscar. It is a great oh, taste. It's a great painting. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the funds to have it at home because I think it's just an incredible mix of like pop culture, um, a, a one dimension, uh, the color, uh, the expression, the expression of the painter himself is quite striking, beautiful piece. And I'm very happy that we have it here in Phoenix. So I have to go and see it and enjoy it. And thank you for explaining um, the tradition of uh, and the uh, information behind um, this beautiful piece. So I know it's past 9.20. 9.20 and it's late. You have to go back to work. I have to go to work back to work tomorrow. And this was quite an amazing time with you. Thank you so much for taking my interview and my time on this wannabe talk show. Oh, Oscar, thank you. And thank you for all that you do for the community and for this podcast. And um, uh, one of the highlights of being in Phoenix has been getting to know you. And you know, I look forward to getting to know you better and having you come down to the Herb Museum. And that's a promise, and I'm sure I'm going to make it because because we have COVID right now doesn't mean the world is coming to an end. We will adapt. <laughs> we will yes. adapt. I'm I'm very <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like we will adapt, and you know me very well. My interest is my community and this city that say hello to me and help me to become of who I am today. So thank you so much. I hope I'll see you on Saturday. I'm sure I will stop mask on, sanitize my hands, and six feet apart from you, like this far. If you forget your sanitizer, we've got gallons of it. <laughs> so. We can celebrate with sanitizer in our hands. Thank you so much for tonight. This was a pleasure, my pleasure. Now, before I let you go, I'm going to leave you just by yourself in front of the camera because I'm asking our leaders to send us all of us a message. So the camera is gonna be just for you. And this is your message to the community. Are you ready? Do you I need time so. to think about it? Yep. Perfect, this is it. Thank you for your note. Go ahead. I'd like to thank the Phoenix community for being so incredibly supportive of the Herb Museum, particularly at this difficult time. I think that the pandemic is going to cast a very long shadow, but I have every confidence that people will rise to meet the moment and to continue doing extraordinary things and providing great inspiration, which we're all in need of at the moment. I hope that you'll, you'll come down to the Herb Museum and find your inspiration. Um, and thank you very much for your time tonight. That's a beautiful message and thank you so much. Sorry that I kept, I just grabbed you, but I needed, we need to listen to messages like this. All of us are cooped up at home. We don't see each other often. We're doing the day today and we don't have this opportunity. So thank you so much from my heart for uh, having you here and for, for being David Roche. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Oscar. Good night. Sleep tight. Good night. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. And that was David Roche from the Herb Museum. Incredible, incredible altogether. The amount of information that we we don't know about our origin, our origins as Arizona, our past, and our traditions. We have a place that is number one in the world for Native American culture. And it's down, this, down the street here in downtown Phoenix that we can go and visit and find out the specifics and find out the information of what was uh, Arizona before, what it is today, and the dreams of the Native American culture and the natives of the Sonoran Desert. This was it for today. I'm very happy that I had the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you to David Roche. Thank you to Christy Bezolas. Thank you to all of you for your time. And I hope to see you next Wednesday 
8 p.m. when I have another incredible guest that I will be announcing soon. Thank you. Have a good night. It's 9.26. I have to go downstairs to eat spicy food. I don't know what Gary cooked, but <laughs> it was spicy and I was, <laughs> I was coughing. So thank you so much. We will see you soon. Bye now. Thank you.